Hi everybody. Today we're going to talk about chapter 14, which is about competition. So over 600 species of plants have been identified that actually eat insects. And these have uh, include sundews, pitcher plants, Venus fly, fly trap. Um, the Venus fly trap, you can see here in this picture, has modified leaves that look like jaws that attract insects with a sweet nectar. The inner surface of the leaf has tiny touch trigger hairs so that when the insect touches the hairs, these leaf jaws um, of the flytrap snap down and trap the insect inside. And then uh, that insect would be digested over the next 5 to 12 days. So that is one way that a plant can acquire nitrogen by eating insects. Pitcher plants um, are also quite deadly to insects and very small critters. Um, it lures the insect inside the pitcher neck and downward facing hairs and there's wax in the bottom of the leaves trap the insect where it is then also digested. So by eating animals these rare plants are able to compete in very nutrient depleted environments and your chapter starts with a really good discussion about how um, this is one aspect of um, how plants might compete for something like nitrogen in a very poor soil content area. So that's an example of an interesting adaptation to strong competition. Um, competition is an interaction between individuals in one or more species where all species involved are negatively affected by their shared use of a resource. So what that means is both species or both individuals that are competing are giving up some kind of energy risk um, to compete for that resource. And there are two basic types of, comp of competition. Uh, intra Inter-specific competition, which is between members of different species, and intra-specific competition, which is between individuals of a single species. So in 1917, A.G. Tansley conducted a series of experiments designed to explain the distribution in Britain of two types of bed straw plants. And this is really known as the first competition experiment. Um, heath bed straw is restricted to acidic soils, while white bed straw is restricted to more alkaline soils. So that's just as a general rule where they occur. So here's a picture of their experimental setup. Um, what this is showing you is if you look at the top, when grown alone, each species could survive in both environment. Um, uh, however, when you grew them together, only heath bed straw survived in the acidic soil and white bed straw survived in the alkaline soils. And so Tansley's experiments were really the first to examine inter-specific competition um, between different species. So he planted them separately and together in either alkaline or acidic soil, and each outcompeted the other species when grown in its natural soil type, Okay, whether it was acidic or um, alkaline. So Tansley did the first real experiments looking at interspecific competition. Okay, what are some of the resources that species compete for? I mentioned nitrogen. Um, resources can be any feature of the environment like food, water, light, space that are required for species to live. Um, <clears throat> and resources are finite. Um, there, are no, there are not resources that are 
um, infinitely available to um, organisms. So the fundamental niche is when we look at an organism's geographic distribution, it's the full set of resources plus other biotic resources that requ uh, a species requires. A realized niche is the restricted set of resources a species is actually limited to during, due to species interactions. So the fundamental niche is much, much less restricted than the realized niche due to interactions like competition that limit um, the fundamental niche. So competition is what forces species into their realized niche instead of being able to be present across the full potential set of um, abiotic requirements that, that it has. Instead, competition forces it into its realized niche. It's um, a more confined niche. All right, more experiments in competition show that competition is very often an asymmetrical process. Um, David Tillman and colleagues demonstrated competition between two diatom species for the resource silica. Silica is a food resource by growing them first alone and then in competition with each other. So um, he did experiments with two diatom species, those are protists, and when grown together they competed for, for silica um, and one species drove the other to extinction. So let's look at that process here. So here in this figure you're seeing um, the species um, Cynedra and what you can see here is that it reached carrying capacity when grown by itself. And the level of silica, which is in green, dropped down as it was consumed. Same thing for Astronella. Um, Astronella is in red, and you can see that it reached a carrying capacity, and um, silica concentration dropped as that resource was consumed. Now, what happens when we put them both in there together? Well, as you can see, um, Cynerda reduced silica concentrations to lower levels than Astronelica, and so therefore Cynerda outcompeted Astronella when grown together. And you can see the red line, Astronella was driven to extinction. So interspecific competition, it can have two possible outcomes. Um, competitive exclusion, and this is like Tillman saw. However, most dominant species prevent another species from using essential resources, and the inferior species usually may become extinct. That's competitive exclusion. In reality, most species are able to kind of meet uh, a coexistence. And they show what's called competitive coexistence, where the ability to coexist depends on how they're going to be able to split up or share limiting resources. In the 1930s, a Russian ecologist named Gauss, G.F. Gauss, performed lab experiments on competition using three species of single-cell protists called paramecium. And each species reached a stable um, carrying capacity, just like we saw with diatoms. Um, uh, each reached carrying capacity when grown alone. And then when grown together, some were driven to extinction. Okay, so all three species are going to reach a stable carrying capacity when grown alone, but when paired, some species were driven to extinction. So let's take a look at this experiment. Here's Paramecium aurelia, P. aurelia, and 
um, you can see that it was grown and reached carrying capacity. Picodotum did the same thing. And P. bursaria also did the same thing. Okay, so each one grown individually, no problem. Populations grew and then they reached their carrying capacity and leveled off. But what happened when you grow Peorelia with P. caudatum? Well, when that was happened, P. Aurelia drove P. caudatum to extinction. And this is thought it's because they both fed on very similar bacteria floating at the same level in the media that they were stored in. So um, competition was very strong for a similar source or the same source of food. However, we see something slightly different when we pair the other um, organisms, P. caudatum and P. bursaria. Here you see an example of something that we haven't really looked at yet. Um, when these two were grown together, each species was able to lower its individual carrying capacity, but they were able to coexist. And so this is a way of sharing um, resources. And really what um, Gauss thought was that this was due to P. bursaria feeding on yeast that settled at the bottom of the test tubes, whereas um, uh, P. caudatum fed on the floating bacteria that was higher up, um, like we had said before. So they were able to separate their food source enough where they could both um, exist. We call this competitive coexistence. Okay, so just to summarize, P. aurelia drove P. caudatum to extinction because both feed on bacterial cells floating at the top of the growth medium. It's a very strong competition. P. caudatum and P. bursaria were able to coexist, but the carrying capacity of both species was lowered. And that's believed because P. caudatum fed primarily on floating bacteria, while P. bursaria was able to eat the larger yeast cells that settled at the bottom. So they were both able to survive. Okay. So we call that um, resource partitioning. And experiments on these and others led to something called the competitive exclusion uh, principle, where two species that use a limiting resource they cannot exist, um, coexist indefinitely. And resource partitioning is how species are always looking for a way to kind of um, share limiting resources um, by using them in different ways or um, different times of day. Maybe they have different adaptations that allow them to acquire resources slightly differently. So one example of resource partitioning is what happens when non-related species compete for a resource, uh, like seeds in this example. In deserts, rodents and ants both compete for seeds, but because ants in general consume smaller seeds, you can see by this figure, they are able to do resource partitioning and share the larger seeds with the rodents. The rodents feed primarily on larger seeds, while well, you can see the ants feed primarily on the smaller seeds. That's called resource partitioning. Character displacement is an evolutionary con con consequence of resource partitioning that drives a single or different species to evolve over time to favor that resource partitioning. So character displacement um, is something that we saw with Darwin's finches. Um, they've evolved similar characteristics on the same island to compete for predominantly the same seed types that would be present. And Darwin noticed that they may have very differently shaped beaks across different islands, and they may be targeting different types of resources.
So here's a, just a funny cartoon that I found about that. Um, some, in, some of these birds are um, adapted to eat insects and seeds. You can see the one with nectar has a long skinny beak for drinking nectar. Um, the eagle down there for prey. And look, this one's evolved to eat breakfast cereal. Ha uh ha. -huh. Just making sure you're still awake out there. So, biotic interactions can influence competition as well. Things like herbivory or predation. And um, if herbivores prefer to feed on the superior competitor, the growth, survival, or reproduction of that species would be reduced, which would be um, good for the inferior competitors. So here's an experiment that was actually discussed at the very beginning of your textbook. I think this was introduced in chapter one. Um, herbivores can remove a dominant uh, can remove a dominant plant competitor, allowing other species to survive. Okay, and so in this study, what researchers did is that it. Well, there's, a, there's an outbreak of beetle that happens every 5 to 15 years that specializes on goldenrod. Goldenrod is the yellow flower in this diagram. And the beetles will just decimate and eat goldenrod if they're given, um, you know, given access to it. So in this study, um, researchers planted plots with all different types of um, wildflowers in it. You can see there's a lot of different species of plants in, in these two plots on either side of this lady. And in this study, researchers sprayed an herbicide on one of the plots to keep the dominant predatory beetle that eats the goldenrod off of the plots. Okay, So the sprayed plots eliminated the beetle that would eat goldenrod. Then they also left some sp plots unsprayed, and those allowed the beetles to feed on the goldenrod that was present. And so you can see by the results that clearly show plants in sprayed plots were able to keep the beetle off plants, and goldenrod was the dominant competitor. And in unsprayed plots, beetles fed on the goldenrod, um, allowing all those other different species to survive and come out. So this is an example of herbivory affecting the outcome of competition. So species can compete with each other either directly or indirectly. And indirect is exploitation competition. Individuals, um, they can reduce the supply of a resource as they use it. So it's not a direct um, interaction. One example here would be maybe one species of plant in an area consumes all the nitrogen, leaving all the other species nitrogen starved. That's an indirect um, type of competition. We call that exploitation competition. Direct competition is called interference competition. And this is where one, uh, in a, one species directly interferes with the ability of its competitors to use a uh, limited resource. And an example of direct interference, an easy one to think of, would be when carnivores fight with each other over prey. That is a direct interaction of competition for a food, a prey item. Um, this is a really cool example. This was mentioned in the video that I had you watch, hopefully that you viewed prior to uh, this lecture. But interference competition can dis display some really cool behaviors. Uh, in New Mexico, you have competition for the same seeds by two different species of ants, harvester and long-legged ants. And early in the morning, around 5 a.m., the long-legged ants will spend several hours plugging up the entrances to harvester ant nests with rocks and soil. And then they go out and they forage for their food. Well, why would they do that? Well, the 
um, harvester ants have to then spend several hours, you can see by the diagram, they have to spend several hours unplugging their nest. And so by the time that they unplug their nest, the other species has already foraged and done its thing. And that's one way that they can share um, a resource. So this is an example of interference competition because this is definitely clear direct interference between um, species. Another less aggressive type of interference competition is allelopathy. Uh, many trees protect their habitat by sending out toxic chemicals through their roots to keep other plants minimum distances away from each other. Um, this can sometimes result in a dispersion pattern where um, they are all equally distanced from each other. Uh, an example is allelopathy in the creosote plant which can result in regular dispersion between um, individuals. And that's to um, help them compete for limited soil nutrients. Okay. All right. Well, that's chapter 14 on competition. I hope you enjoyed.